One of the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's main pledges to voters is that he will stop the boats. In other words, prevent migrants coming illegally across the English Channel. Now he appears to be backtracking on a promise to do it before the next election. Just how big an issue is immigration for voters, though? We spoke to Conservative MP and former Immigration Minister Caroline Noakes to ask why she's been so critical of the Tory government's policies. Welcome to the programme. I'm Philip Hampshire. Britain's next general election is likely to be held next year, and the Conservative government is looking at a historic defeat if recent polls prove to be correct. In a bid to win over voters, Rishi Sunak has promised to stop the boats. He appears to have calculated that getting tough on immigration is going to be a vote winner. Earlier, my colleague Enda Brady asked the former Conservative Minister for Immigration, Caroline Noakes MP, whether Sunak has already failed in his promise. Well, I'm joined now by Caroline Noakes, a Conservative Party MP in Britain and a former Minister of State for Immigration. She has been critical of this Conservative government's migration policies. She also voted against Brexit. Caroline, great to see you on Roundtable. Your Prime Minister, your leader, Rishi Sunak, he has this mantra, stop the boats. He's failing with this, isn't he? Well, there is always a danger with a narrative that is around stopping the boats. You're in the hands of the French here, and the only place to stop those small craft from making a terribly perilous journey is on the beaches of northern France, although arguably even further upstream than that. And this is a global migrant crisis. We are seeing huge flows coming through the whole of Europe from the Middle East, from North Africa, and the question is, how much can we work with our European neighbours and friends to counteract this as a, a combined solution? So why hasn't this government and previous governments reached out to the French more and done more to rebuild relations between Paris and London? Well, look, we've all reached out to them an enormous amount. And when I was immigration minister, I can remember many a meeting with my French counterparts. I can remember going to Calais, looking at the, the scale of the problem, that massive coastline, which we know is very difficult for them to police. But do not forget that the British government has given an enormous sum of money to the French, is working very hard to try and encourage the French to, to yet greater endeavours. And I think that that is, that is where the solution lies. It has to be with joint action with the French. And it has to be about really robust action on those beaches and stopping the boats before they ever get on the water. So 100,000 people have come to the UK this way in five years. That's a, that's a city size of population arriving here. Yeah, it's an enormous number and it is unplanned. So when you look at some of the, the big schemes that we put in place, whether it was around Ukrainians, whether it was uh, for Afghan uh, nationals who had helped during that uh, crisis, Actually, those were planned schemes. So there were measures put in place to make sure there was somewhere for them to go, that there were school places, that we knew the scale of the challenge. 100,000 people coming with absolutely no plan in place puts massive pressure on public services, on local authorities in particular. And look at Kent County Council, who has had to carry the biggest burden of managing the migrant inflows. And the real challenge is, is how can you a, stop them from coming. B, uh, when they are here, when you do have 100,000 people that you have to house, that you have to make sure that their children can get into school places, that they don't have diseases. We've seen terrible cases of uh, diseases which we thought were uh, eradicated in the UK, like polio, like tuberculosis. Um, so that's very, very difficult for any government and any local authority to manage. Um, but it can't be done in isolation. And I keep going back to, we have to make sure that there are good returns agreements in place. I think the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary did a fantastic job with Albania, putting in place a very rapid scheme so that Albanian migrants, and we know that Albania is a safe country, uh, could be returned quickly. Now, post-Brexit, with the uh, ending for us of the Dublin Agreement, we need to have returns agreements with countries around the globe 
so that we can see people who are coming here claiming asylum from a country that we know to be safe, that their, uh, that their claim be uh, rejected swiftly and then be fast-tracked back to their country of origin. Caroline, you're on record as saying that the government's policies risk inhumane treatment of migrants. Is that something you still believe? So, look, my select committee and I chair the Women and Equalities Committee has looked at the treatment of women and people with protected characteristics within the asylum system. The thing I always go back to and repeat to anybody who is prepared to listen is why should we be treating an Afghan woman who has arrived on a small boat any differently to an Afghan woman that arrived here through one of our other schemes? We know that many women helped the UK and the United Nations and everybody out in region. And we know that a, a female Afghan interpreter or a member of parliament or a judge or a police officer will be at risk in Afghanistan with the resurgence of the Taliban who have shown an absolutely appalling attitude towards women and girls. So look, I am very worried that those women in particular, but also gay people, people with disabilities, elderly people, are at risk of being put onto uh, barges where we know there are very serious health conditions, at risk of being sent into large scale marquees or tents where there isn't adequate safeguarding of vulnerable individuals from potentially predatory uh, males of whom we know nothing. And, and I look at the Rwanda scheme and what I see is a huge, huge expense for not one single migrant to have been sent to Rwanda. And my question repeatedly to ministers has been, are you gonna send children to Rwanda? Are you gonna send whole family units out there? Uh, not just unaccompanied children, but children with their parents. Are you actually going to remove them to Rwanda? Are you going to put them in detention prior to doing that? And at what point does that policy come into conflict with the very real obligations we have under the Children's Act to make sure that children in the UK are looked after? Caroline Knotts, thank you. Joining me in the studio today, we have Norman Baker, a former UK Home Office Minister for the Liberal Democrat Party, and Claire Pearsall, who is a former Special Advisor at the Home Office for the Conservatives. Thank you both very much for joining me. Now, at the end of that interview, which my colleague uh, Ender had done, um, the comment was made, at what point does that policy of sending children, perhaps unaccompanied, to Rwanda come into conflict with the very real obligations under the Children's Act to make sure that children in the UK are looked after. Claire, uh, how do you deal with that? Well, I think Caroline is quite right to raise that issue. It is incredibly important that you safeguard children and vulnerable adults alike. But especially when you're looking at children who are unaccompanied, who is going to ensure that their rights are retained, their healthcare needs are met, their educational needs are met, and their cultural needs are met. And if you are sending them to a country where you are unsure that that is going to take place, then that isn't going to happen. And I think you are in breach of the Children's Act, but also you've got international law that also steps in to protect these children. So the United Kingdom does need to be incredibly careful. Norman. Well, I agree with Claire on that point, and the government has uh, made this as big action point uh, dealing with immigration. Uh, it plays to the far right in this country. Uh, international law goes out of the window. People are calling for us to leave the European Commission on Human Rights. Uh, and the questions that Caroline Noakes asked have not been answered. Uh, the only redeeming feature is I don't think we're ever going to send people to Rwanda because I think the courts will stop it. For the next part of this, um, we've got a clip here from Rishi Sunak talking about uh, the boats crossing the channel. Uh, here's what he had to say on the matter. It's not an easy problem to fix. I never said it would be able to solve it overnight. It will take time and we have to attack it from lots of different ways. But I am pleased that the number of illegal migrants crossing this year is down for the first time in some years. That shows that our plans are working. But of course there's still more to do and people should know I am determined to grip this problem and that's why one of my five priorities is to stop the boats. Will it be done by the next election? So I want it to be done as, as soon as possible but I also want to be honest with people that it is a complex problem there's not one simple solution and it can't be solved overnight and I wouldn't be being straight with people if I said that was possible. Now that's moving on from children a little bit here, uh, Norman, yeah. but stopping the boats, this has been a big pledge of his. Do you think it was a good move for him to do it or was it a mistake? Well, to use an old-fashioned phrase, he's hoist with his own petard because he chose that because it was going to play to his electorate as you saw it and to his backbenchers and he can't deliver it. 
because it's out of his control. I mean, the reality is that we're going to see an increase in migration across the world because we've got lots of destabilised regimes, people leaving those to look for security somewhere else. We've got uh, migration because of climate change uh, happening now and also water shortages. So this is not going to be solved overnight. Uh, and Caroline Noakes was quite right in her piece to say that it has to be solved by international agreement and we can't stop the boats. What a ridiculous, uh, simplistic uh, phrase to come up with. He can't deliver on it. And he's now rowing back, to coin a phrase, I suppose, on, on his boat's pledge, because he knows it can't be delivered. That's the simple truth of the matter. Claire, what did you make of this position taken by Rishi that he wanted to stop the boats? And originally, of course, he, he's now changing his position, but originally it would be done before the next election. Well, as Norman has just said, it was never going to be possible. And, and the sad fact of politics in the United Kingdom at the moment is everything is done by a three-word slogan. And that becomes the mantra. He hopes people will then come along with his idea. But unfortunately, you cannot solve the problem of migration into the United Kingdom by just looking at 26 miles of water between us and France. It has to be with international cooperation. You need to look at the routes people are coming. But unfortunately, this has now become a millstone round his neck. It isn't going to happen. And we have an election coming up in possibly 12 months' time, which is going to be incredibly problematic if this isn't sorted out. OK, but why do you think that he chose migration? There are plenty of things that governments can fight elections on. Um, generally speaking, uh, sort of political scientists say that voters can hold, only hold sort of three to five ideas in their mind. And when they go into the voting booth, they're not thinking about rural cycle paths or certain aspects that are lower salience. Usually they're thinking about the economy or defence or education, something that's relatively big, perhaps health care. Why did he go with migration, do you think? I think one of them is that it's a very populist issue. It's very easy to find footage of people coming across and say, we need to stop this, we can solve this problem. But it also can be used as a distraction technique. You were saying about the economy, the National Health Service, education. If things aren't going right in those areas, then you can always use this as a distraction away from the other parts of the country that aren't doing quite so well. And you sort of say, look at the boats problem, we're going to fix this, but the economy, healthcare, not so much, so please don't look that way. So I think there's a multi of reasons why, but also quite a lot of his backbenchers want this. They are more to the right than centre, and this is the kind of issue that they like. Now, Norman, I'm assuming you're going to agree with much of that, so yes. let, let, let me put this slightly differently to you. Given that it is a populist issue, and rightly or wrongly, if you were to poll the major people of the United Kingdom, the majority of them are relatively anti-immigration, is he placing the Labour Party, which is, of course, the most likely party to win the next UK general election, in a difficult position here? I'm not sure that immigration is such a touchstone issue for people up and down the country as Richie Sunak seems to think it is. So you think um, it's lower down this salience rank that I, think, I was talking I think about. it is. He's pushed it up there, which is to his own disadvantage, but I don't think it is that issue. And I think people are more open-minded about immigration than perhaps he gives them credit for. We've seen since Brexit labour shortages across the place. We've seen people who want to come here to invest and to study being dis dissuaded from doing so, and people pick this up. Now, it may be a popular in the so-called Red Wall in the North, uh, which is where his, his backbenchers who are pushing from it by and large come from, but it's not popular in the so-called Blue Wall in the South, where the Conservatives are fighting the Liberal Democrats, because the Conservative voters in those sorts of areas actually have a more rounded view, in my, in my opinion, of, of life in general and don't like this kind of nastiness, which is now coming back. You know, Theresa May, uh, 20 years ago, whatever it was, talked about the Conservatives being a nasty party. That's where they're going again, and it's not an electoral success. Do you agree with that, Claire? I, I do agree with, with some of that, um, but I do think that the one area where you're not quite there is um, looking at the South and the voters down there. But I live in the county of Kent, who see the crossings coming off coming over on an almost daily basis. And my own county that takes in unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. And we are full to the brim. We are taking on an enormous burden. And yes, everybody is kind and understanding and wants those children to be safe. 
but it has to be fair. And I think that's what people look at. They would like to help people, but they want it to be fairly distributed. And unfortunately, what we're seeing at the moment is that some counties are taking in the majority of these individuals, and there are some counties who aren't pulling their weight. And I think that is much more of an issue when it comes to localised elections and localised thinking. They want it to be fair. If we look at some of the numbers on this, we're looking at figures in the region of... Uh... 2022, uh, we had 45,755 people cross the channel, made up 45% of asylum applications. 2023, bear in mind we're only uh, looking for figures up to August 14. Uh, it's now 16,790 who've crossed the channel. Uh, June saw a one-month record, though, of 3,824. But if we extrapolated that 2023 figure all the way through to the end of the year, Norman, part of the problem Rishi Sunak has is because he said, I'm going to stop the boats, he set the figure at zero. Yes. If it's in said, say, said, we'll reduce it to an acceptable level of immigration, almost anything can be well, argued I, as an acceptable level. I mean, look, he's, he's now trying to get back into the arrangement with the EU, which is quite right, actually, should do. Uh, whereby, before Brexit, we were able, to, through the Dublin Agreement, as Caroline Noakes referred to in her piece, to return people to other EU countries. That went out the window when we left the EU. The EU has an arrangement to return people to 24 non-EU countries. That's gone out the window when we left the EU. So, ironically, those who voted for Brexit, thinking we're going to control our borders, ended up voting for something which was less of a control on our borders. So, uh, he, he hasn't got an answer to that, and he won't come up with an answer to that. It's also worth pointing out that other countries... I'm not, I'm not diminishing the impact that immigration has, particularly in places like Kent. But, I mean, the fact... Kent, that, Kent County Council's under enormous it, strain, it because I, it's I, actually I one that. of the poorer counties in the entire UK, because apart from the commuter belt going into London, there aren't a lot of big businesses and jobs down in the county. No, I, I accept that, and Claire's quite right to raise that point about the impact on Kent County Council and Kent in general, and there's not a fair distribution. But actually, if you look at the number of people migrating across the world, far fewer actually are coming into this country than are going to other countries in Europe. But here's a couple of things. First of all, only 1% of those who came in in the last year on boats have been actually processed by the Home Office. So Home Office is useless at processing people. And if we got people processed more quickly, then the problem would be diminished from where it is now. The second thing is that most people who arrive by boats, actually, when they're examined, are deemed to be genuine refugees. That's a majority. It's, I think I've forgotten the figures. 90% or something really high are deemed to be genuine refugees. So, you know, I don't like this nasty talk about illegal immigrants because, you know, under international law, um, whether you are legal or not determines on whether or not your case stands up uh, as refugee status or not. That's the term the determining factor. And I think, again, as Carolyn Nooks said in her piece, you know, an Afghan woman coming in by a boat uh, or an Afghan woman coming in by a safe route actually, they should be judged in the same way. Is it a genuine case or isn't it? The method of transporting into the country is, by and large, relevant. Uh, but it's been, it's been changed in the, government's, in the government's terminology to say that if you come by a boat, it's illegal. That's not illegal. What's illegal is if you refuse to leave the country when you're deemed to be not a genuine asylum seeker. Claire, um, is there a difference if somebody's coming across in a boat or if they've flown in on a plane, which seems to be a distinction that the government is somehow making? It, it does. Uh, people can fly into the United Kingdom and get to the, United, uh, get to the border and say they want to claim asylum. It is slightly different to arrive by what is normally known as an irregular route, which is back of a lorry or on a small boat, as we have seen for the majority of these individuals. It, unfortunately, to claim asylum in the United Kingdom, you need to be physically here. If you cannot afford a flight, if you do not have your passport because you've had to flee your country, then you can't do that and you, you are left with an irregular route. So I think that is the real problem. But I think Norman is right with the language side of it. The government is being deliberately inflammatory by calling people illegal. And this is an invasion. And I really wish that would stop because at the end of the day, these are some incredibly vulnerable human beings who require looking after, who deserve to be treated fairly. I recall from my time at the BBC, in any editorial meeting where somebody used the phrase illegal immigrant, somebody would stand up and say there's no such thing as an illegal human being, as a for instance on yeah. that. 
Why do you think he's in the position that he's in? If he, he's, he's not an idiot. He's a very smart man. He's a very wealthy man. He's a very well-educated man. He can read polls as well as any of the three of us can. So he looks at the polls. He can, he can see he's not making headway there. Why doesn't he change tack, pick a different subject? because it will still keep being brought up. Because there are those people within the party who are so determined to turn around and say, we have stopped the boats. They are so wedded to the Rwanda plan, they cannot see that there is a bigger picture in all of this. And it's a very quick election win in some constituencies. In some areas, it will matter a lot more. And if those MPs can go back to their constituents and say, we have done it, Rishi Sunak has stopped the votes, he's stopped all these people coming over, it will win votes there. For the Conservative Party as a whole, it isn't such a good picture. And I wish that he would move on to something like the economy, which affects everybody equally. But I'm, it's just not going to happen. Unfortunately, this has now become the defining moment of Rishi Sunak's premiership. Norman, what does this mean for the Liberal Democrats? Now, for those not in the UK, the Liberal Democrats are the uh, always the bridesmaid, rarely the bride. They're always uh, the third party that, uh, that comes through. Can they actually turn this around into a winning... Uh, a winning issue for them, given that Labour's already on top of the issue? Well, Labour's not really on top of the issue. Labour is adopting Conservative policies and just to deliver them rather better than the Conservatives do. That's the line they're adopting on every single aspect of policy, whether it's a health service or education or anything else. It's pathetic, to be honest with you, the way that Labour's behaving. But the Lib Dems aren't doing a great deal better, I'm sorry to say. Uh, in my view, the, if you're a Lib, the Lib Dem leader, a Lib Dem campaign person, what you need to do is to strike a, a position, just take a position which is morally and ethically based, and you rally people around your flag, as Paddy Ashton did back with, uh, with Bosnia, uh, as Charles Kennedy did with the Iraq war. And, you know, being, being kind of just safe is not a sensible strategy electorally for the Lib Dems. They should come out with a principled position on immigration and indeed at everything else and rally people to their flag, because there isn't much principle going on in either Labour, Tory or Labour parties at the moment. But what do you do on the immigration issue that the Liberal Democrats aren't doing, given that, again, you face this issue that immigration, regardless of whether it's very high on people's level of importance, when they've just faced inflation at 20%, which is rather more likely to be at the front of their well, minds... There, there, isn't, there isn't a simple del delivery for tomorrow. Yep. What you can do, first of all, is reinstate uh, international aid for those countries which are uh, in a mess because you want to try and keep people in their own countries so far as possible. You need to have international agreement with other countries to try to ensure um, a, a secure world, uh, one which is secure in defence terms, but also in terms of uh, migration issues. You need to make sure that uh, you have dealings with the European Union on a sensible basis, so we deal with countries on our borders who will, we can work together with those. We need to ensure there are safe routes for, for people coming in so that actually we can challenge those who come in illegally uh, to use a conservative word, uh, rather because there are alternatives which they're not using. We need to make sure that children aren't held in detention. That was something which we brought in under the coalition uh, and is now being reneged upon. Um, we need to make sure that um, people have access to proper legal advice, but not legal advice that goes on for months, which appears to be the case at the moment. We have to ensure that Home Office processes people more quickly, because it's hopeless at the moment, the number of people who are waiting to be processed. And this is my view, not necessarily Lib Dem view, I think people who come into this country waiting to be processed ought to be allowed to work. I think they should be allowed to work for their own dignity, but also to contribute taxation money to the economy. I don't know why we don't do that. Claire, um, within the Conservative Party, almost all political parties, and unless they're a single-issue party, they're a sort of an amalgamation, a patchwork that's been stitched together. Mm -hmm. Why, within the Conservative Party, does this one block, this anti-immigration, extremely hard right... The, the Conservative Party is a right-wing party, but there are plenty of different kinds of right-wing. You've got a libertarian right-wing, you've got a, a pro-business right-wing. Why is one group dictating policy? I think because we have more of those voices than we have ever had previously. If you look back at the election of 2019 under Boris Johnson, we had a, an awful lot of new MPs come in who were slightly more on that right populist side of the argument. So I think we just have more of them. I think they are louder. And I think that social media and certain other media channels don't help the issue because it just gets amplified. And unfortunately, 
anybody else who comes in with a different view is often shouted down, is told they are no better than the Labour Party, that they should leave the Conservative Party. So you immediately silence those voices. The debate issue, you can't have it. You cannot go in and have a sensible conversation or a debate about it. You are either told that you are right, you are wrong, and to get out of the room if you don't believe the same as they do. And it's the same as happening with the Republican Party in the States, as a matter of fact, uh, where the Trump Trumpian wing uh, is as intolerant as the people Claire is referring to in, in, the, in the Conservative Party, and the people who are moderate in the Republican Party find themselves homeless to a large degree. And I think the, rel the sensible people in the Conservative Party, of, wh of whom there are many, um, are, are silenced, and that's not right. And I look back to the Conservatives I work with, you know, including Theresa May, actually, and you think, well, where have they gone? Theresa May is now seen as kind of left wing in this Conservative Party. I mean, how has that happened? Norman, Claire, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you in here with me today uh, talking about this very emotive and difficult subject. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate if you head on over to our YouTube channel. Just pop over to YouTube and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and the entire team, thank you for watching and goodbye.